Hello, welcome to the twelfth and final set of lectures in this course on business ethics. In this um, segment lectures, set of lectures, I'm going to talk about the issue of sustainability, the problem of our obligations to future generations or to posterity, and I'm going to talk about how to usually think um, ethically about the environment, but yet in terms of the economic tools that we have for thinking about the environment. A lot of environmental policy um, borders on economics, and to do environmental ethics, we're going to have to, uh, do, again, do a little bit of economics. There's lots of environmental problems lurking. Um, and many of these are going to affect future generations. Some of them affect us now, and some of them are going to be a lot worse in future in, in, for posterity. For example, the greenhouse ga um, gas effect and the, uh, the ensuing climate change, disposal of toxic wastes, the depletion of non-renewable resources, our supplies of uh, oil are going down, maybe not coal so much, but oil, and the exhaustion of um, agriculture and other resources. These are all um, problems that they're environmental problems they're going to affect us marginally, and they're going to affect future generations even more. The worry is that the market economy, this um, thing that we're trying to justify here, is like some sort of giant machine, and it takes present-day natural resources and runs them through the market economy, produces um, present-day consumption, which is a good thing. But it also produces pollution for future generations, and it produces less resources for future generations. We're, to turn, we're using up the world now. This is our, our worry. How can, what can we do about this? How, could, how should we think about this? Um, and what are some of the economic tools that we have for, uh, that, that can be used to uh, resolve these problems in an ethical way? Well, this whole thinking about environmental ethics starts with this idea of moral standing. Whose interests should we consider? Okay. Uh, and the whose could be a person, as we're used to, or an organization, but it could also be a non-human entity, like an animal, or plants, or an ecosystem, or um, there's a whole bunch of different varieties here. <coughs> theories, uh, ethical theories that think only about uh, human interests are called anthropocentric. Anthropos is same root as my name, Andrew. I think it means it's the Greek name for, uh, actually means male, mankind, but we'll use it in the inclusive sense to mean humankind. So human-centered ethical theories. Um, the, the only, uh, only us, only members of the species Homo sapiens have moral standing. But you can also have non-anthropocentric ethical theories that extend this notion of moral standing to non-human entities. And there are these theories, and we're not going to be able to spend much time thinking about them here, but I just want to bring them up uh, because uh, they, they do exist and many people subscribe to them. So we have in this course been adopting this notion of the comprehensive view of moral standing. We've talked about our duties to the self, member of the ethical egoism, owners, employees, suppliers, customers, the local community. The global community is what we have been looking at just uh, just now in the last uh, in the last lecture. The local and global communities. What uh, what does the role of the economic system, a free enterprise economic system, in making uh, in issues of justice for people um, nearby and for people far away? In this uh, talk, I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to think about our duties to posterity, future generations, our, and the sustainability of our world, and uh, to the environment more generally. In environmental ethics, at least as I've always taught it, I think of the uh, moral standing as being something that expands. We start with ourself, down the beginning of the ethical egoism, we extend it to nearby people through um, utilitarianism, rights-based thinking, justice-based thinking, etc., etc., and then also to people all around the globe, distant people. Well, that's, that's all regular ethics, and we've, that's what we've done so far. Now we're going to start thinking about um, future people. This is the idea of sustainability and the, our obligations to future people. But there's that 
types of environmental ethics that think about animals and think about plants and other living things and even worry about uh, about ecosystems. So the issues that arise in environmental ethics are particularly, and this is what we particularly think about here, future generations of people, but it also raises um, questions about the treatment of non-human animals, um, like um, uh, livestock farms where everything is intensive and uh, the animals are maybe not treated as, uh, as well as they would be uh, out on a pasture or something. Uh, biocentric ethics that looks at all forms of life, um, the ethical treatment of all forms of life. Ecocentric ethics that thinks about um, ecosystems and different uh, viewpoints on this, ecofeminism, deep ecology. All of these are ways of thinking about the environment that are interesting and we're going to have to pass them by at the moment. Most of my talk is going to be about economic approaches to environmental ethics and in that I'm going to look at assume a sort of anthropocentric theory of um, of moral standing human the interests of human beings whether they're alive now or whether they'll be alive in the future are what matter and I'm just going to uh, we're largely thinking of things in terms of their instrumental value uh, their their value for the, the things that are valuable because they are instrumental in causing something else that is uh, that, that, that is more valuable for like for example human happiness or human well health, human welfare so these this notion of instrumental value contrasts with notion of intrinsic value that is perhaps the fundamental um, consideration of uh, environmental ethics um, the definitions are that a state of affairs is instrumentally valuable if it can bring about or cause another state of affairs that is valuable. For example, like a $20 bill is of no particular value to any, um, you know, intrinsically, it's just a piece of, well, now plastic, but it, or, but it is useful because it, you can use it to cause another state of affairs, which is like, you know, getting a nice lunch or something, expensive lunch. Uh, and a state of affairs is intrinsically valuable if it's valuable for its own sake. That's the crucial thing here. Not because of some other state of affairs that it can bring about. For example, the existence of a national park. It may have some economic impact, but that's not the main thing. The park is should be preserved for its own sake. Okay, so just get those notions in your head. Which of the following is the best example of instrumental value and an anthropocentric view of moral standing? Pause the video and think about these for a second. Oops, sorry. We should preserve the wonderful biodiversity of the rainforest no matter what happens. Um, <clears throat> what's going on here? No matter what, biodiversity is good no matter what. Hmm. It's not instrumental and it's not making any reference to um, human interest no matter what. Contrast that with B, we should conserve the biodiversity of the rainforest, same thing, um, to give future generations of people access to this diversity of genetic resources, things that will be useful to them, in, of instrumental value to them. I think you can see now that here we've got an anthropocentric view because it's the interests of future generations, and we've got a... Um, um, treating the rainforest not for its own sake, as invaluable for its own sake, but because it has a bunch of resources for humans. So our answer will be this. All right, we'll stop here for this uh, time, and I will come, we'll come back and look at some of the economic approaches to um, the environment that will concern us.